All right, this question and answer time. So if you have a question, come ask Dr. Lovett right now, okay? Dr. When the, when the transfiguration where they had that glorified body and when Jesus was resurrected, it seemed to be like a normal body. Is there two types of bodies? Now the first part of the question again. Yeah. Well, when they find that the transfiguration and Moses' body, they, yeah. they seem to know that uh, known by appearance. Yeah. When Jesus was resurrected, he seemed to be just normal. Is there two types of bodies? All right. Uh, that's kind of a hard question to answer, but I'll show you a couple things there. Uh, first of all, turn to John, and notice Christ's resurrection body here is not like the resurrection body he has on the mountain. Uh, John chapter 20 and Matthew chapter 17. Now, uh, Matthew chapter 17 is the, uh, is the resurrection body that appears on the mountain, but it's transfigured. And Christ's resurrection body is not, like, not even like that. Now, there's another thing about it. <coughs> uh, <coughs> keep, uh, Matthew 17 and John 20, and then uh, pick up Jude. It is a body that uh, isn't resurrected, and um, it must become a glorified body without dying, but you're not sure when it becomes a glorified body. Well, I would take first of all Matthew 17. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 17, verse uh, 1. After six days, he was taken up Peter, James, and John, his brother, and drink of the high mountain apart, and was transfigured. Not trans, to go across. If it's uh, trying to believe it, it's picked up in one language and put down in another. If before each translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God, he picked up in one place, put down another. If it's trans-American, it goes across America. If it's trans-Atlantic, it goes across Atlantic. That's a transit, see it moves. So his trans-figure, the figure changes. His figure goes from one figure to another. Before them, and his face did shine as the sun, his rain was white as the light. Now, verse 3 doesn't say that about Moses or Elijah. If they were, it doesn't say it about it. They're just there. But now here's the problem, when you come to John chapter 20, here's Christ in a resurrection body, and it's not trying to take it. And it does not appear as light. As a matter of fact, it's so plain that Mary thinks it's the gardener. John chapter 20. Uh, John chapter 20, uh, verse uh, uh, 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping, and she wept, she stopped, stooped down into the sepulcher. Uh, verse uh, 14, when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Underline this. She, supposing him to be the gardener, he must have awful common in body. That's a resurrection body. But it is transfigured. It looks like a gardener standing there. And by the same token, when Christ appears in the road to Emmaus and his a resurrected body, they don't see the kind of thing. They just see a normal man there, and they think it's just a man talking to them. I thought a stranger only in Jerusalem and not know what has come to pass there these days. So a resurrection body is going to be like the body of Christ, but that has two stages. One is that the human body looks like Christ's human body was and came up from the dead, but the other is it can become transfigured in glory, like he's transfigured. Now, when he was transfigured, uh, that thing there was a picture of Christ in glory. Uh, get, uh, get Jude. Now, here's Jude, but this thing here is on, on Enoch. And Jude, uh, it mentions Enoch in verse uh, 14. <clears throat> Jude 14, Enoch also, the seven from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, The Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Now, Enoch is a trip. Because old Enoch is alive in Genesis 5, and he's translated that he should not see death, which means he's in a glorified body. But uh, he's in a glorified body that, uh, like 
fullness of the life, but he can't die. And the question comes up, how does he get this glorified body without being in the body of Christ? He's not in the body of Christ. And he does come up with the resurrection. He's already gone. So you have a number of variables here. Here's the first one. Here's a guy that doesn't die and never will die, and he's caught to heaven given some kind of a body that can't ever die. And it's not in the rapture of the church and it's not in the resurrection of Christ. That's in it. Enoch can't die. The reason why he can't die, there has to be one person in the Bible who never dies. Because Christ said, if a man lives and believes on me, he'll never die. So the type of the Christian who's caught up when Christ comes is Enoch. That's the type. And one of the surest proofs in the Bible, you get caught up before the tribulation breaks loose, is Enoch get caught up before the flood breaks loose. That's one of the biggest things in the Bible. Folks, they give me one verse to prove a, prove a pre-trib rapture. That one right there. There's only one man in the Bible that never died and never will die. It's Enoch. So he's given some kind of a body that, that's preserved forever. Uh, the second man is uh, Moses. But Moses dies. And yet you see him in Matthew 17 up. So Moses is resurrected before the resurrection. And the way that way you read right there in Jude, uh, the devil comes down and disputes with Michael the archangel about the body of Moses. So old Moses is buried, and by the time he's buried, the devil shows up and says, uh, what are you doing? And Michael says, I'm, I'm, I'm a body snatcher. I'm digging this body out and I'm going to use it. And the devil says, you can't do that. The resurrection has come yet. And Michael says, you know the scripture better than I do. I ain't going to argue with you. The Lord rebuked it and shut him up and took the body. So in Matthew chapter 17, Moses shows up alive. But Moses is going to come back in the tribulation, Revelation chapter 11, get his head cut off. But his body dies twice. So the body he gets when he goes up there to glory can die again. But when he comes back, it's his head cut off, Revelation 11. Here's the third one. Elijah is caught up to heaven without dying. He's caught up one of the world in 2 Kings chapter 2. So Elijah will appear with Christ in out of transfiguration. But Elijah's coming back and have his head go off. So whatever that body is, that body is not an immortal body like he ain't got. So you've got three kind of taken bodies in here. You've got a body that can't ever die, ain't it? You've got a body that's up in heaven and glory and preserved for 1,500 years that can die again. And you've got a body of the resurrected Christ that looks like a gardener and a, and a picture of the resurrected Christ in glory that looks like he's translated. Now, six different cases in there. Now, on, uh, on Christ's transfiguration, it's under 2 Peter chapter 1, and notice when it speaks about that transfigured body. That transfigured body is, has to do with the second advent. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. It's not a first advent phenomenon. It's a second advent phenomenon. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed uh, cunningly devised tables when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's a king. They saw a picture of the second coming. Matter of fact, right before you got in Revelation, uh, Matthew 17, it said, Christ said, there be some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom coming in its power. And about six days later, he took them up. So that thing that took place in, uh, in Matthew 17, the picture of the second advent, verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard, we were with him in the holy mount, Matthew 17. Verse 19, prophecy. Verse 20, prophecy. Verse 21, prophecy. The second advent. So I ask that question as God is capable of making a number of, of resurrection bodies that don't match. God can give a man a resurrection body that can't ever die. That's evening. God even thought a resurrection body that can die. That's Moses. God give a man a resurrection body that looks like an ordinary human being. That's Christ, Luke chapter 24. Uh, they were terrified and afraid and disposed. They'd seen a spirit. And he said, Fear not, peace be unto you. Hang me and see that as I myself, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. Have you seen me hands, see? And then finally, in glory. 
that body is transfigured in glory. So it no more looks like a human body. It's shining like the sun. Or oh, something else. In James chapter 3, verse 6, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it may defile us the or that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature. What, is that, what does that mean, it setteth on fire the course of, course of nature? All right, uh, verse 6. Now, this thing is uh, what's called figurative language. And some of the Bible is figurative. However, as you know, a fellow, if he wants to get rid of a verse, he says it's figurative. For example, Billy Graham says there's no real hell and no real fire in hell. Yes, there is. Here's how you knew it. In the parable of the tears and wheat, Christ gets down in it and he says, The man that sowed the good seed is the son of man. Definition. The enemy that sowed the tares is the devil. Definition. The seed of the wheat is the good the children of the kingdom. Definition. The tares is the children of the wicked one. Definition. The field is the world. Definition. The harvest is the end of the world. Definition. The reapers are the angels. Definition. The fire is what's the fire? It's fire. See how you get the truth out of those things? If the fire was figured in, he would have said the fire is. But in that parable, everything in that parable is given a definition except the fire. So it's fire and be fire. Like I showed you last night. And Billy said it's figured. It's no, it ain't figured. It was figured. He would have told you what the figure meant. Now here's the rule. And this is homiletical. This is hermeneutics and stuff. The rule is this. Always take a passage to be literal, always, unless it is absolutely impossible. If it is absolutely impossible to take it literally, then take it figuratively. That's the rule. Now, the unbelievable rule is this. Always make it figuratively, unless you have to take it literally. So, again, yeah, that's a negative approach. It's always take it literal unless it cannot be literal. And when the unsaved man looks at hell fire, he says, well, it couldn't be literal, because God just wouldn't do it or anything like that. I mean, human mind insists in judgment of the Word of God, so what God will not burn forever. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. Now it goes. Well, if you're going to get a surprise, now I'll give you some examples of figurative language. Um, uh, it's time to hit the sack. Now, how many of you know what that means? How do you know what that means? How do you ladies know what that means? Whoever told you ladies the sack was a bed that you had to hit it? You know where thing came from? It came from World War II. And a, when you sleep in, a, in an army bunk, it has a mattress cover on the mattress. And that's a sack. It's a sack you bury for them. And as well as the bath, they call them a sad sack. And ever since World War II, many women have been saying it's time to hit the sack. But, you know, when it's time to go to bed, you pick out a bag and beat the thing. Okay, it's time to hit the road. Everybody around, they get a ball, ball back and smack that black top with it, you know. It's trying to hit the road. See those things? Here's a good one. Step on the gas. There's no gas in the car unless it's carbon monoxide. You're going to get killed. You mean gasoline? Step on the gasoline. That won't start your car, stepping on the gasoline. You're stepping on a pedal. See? See those things are figurative. That's figurative language. Uh, all kinds of stuff like the kettle's boiling. Well, B, you're burning your stove with shot, man, at the kettle's boy. <laughs> what you mean is the stuff in it? Here's a good one. God, he won't light the fire. How can you light a fire? It's already, the fire is already burning. Go light the fire. Here's a good one, though. It's raining. It's raining what? Rain is a bird, isn't it, now? It's a bird. It's raining. But it's been water so much that now when you say it, you just take for granted it's water. In that Bible, it rains fire. And it rains hail. And it rains manna. And it rains water. So those stuff is figurative. Okay? He rolled his eyes out. Serve me a cup of tea. See, <laughs> 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 that stuff, and I figured it. Now, for example, Christ says, I am the door. 
well, come on now. I mean, you, you don't come up here with a hand and turn him and swing him back in the hinges. Here's a good one here. Oh, oh I know my sheep. That's you. Now we get through tonight. You're not going to go out there and graze in the front yard. <laughs> get down here four legs and eat the grass. And bah, see, the state. Oh, I don't what you have here. James 3, verse 6. The tongue is a fire. Well, obviously, not, you know, not strike a match or a cigarette lighter. The tongue is, the soul of the tongue is a fire. Well, that can burn people up. Literally. No, figuratively. That, what she said just burned me up. Well, you're still sitting there. You're not burned yet. See, it's figurative. The tongue is a little, a little member, and the tongue is a fire, a world. Well, it's not a world. But it's figurative language, a world of iniquity. That is, uh, all the iniquity in the world can be contained in a tongue, and can tongue and start some stuff that will cover the whole world. For example, here's a fellow over in uh, Germany, and he's in Austria, not a German, and he gets up in a speech. And he calls us 22 million Catholics. Now, you've got to admit that's a pretty good worldwide reach, 22 million Catholics. He doesn't fire a shot. Adolf Hitler never pulled a trigger in a gun in the whole world. The only trigger he ever pulled was a pistol before he blew his brains out there in the ranch town in May of 1945. But he talked. And the tongue of the fire, the world of liquid, so was the tongue among our members. I remember anything that protrudes from your body from the, from the trunk that moves. That defileth the whole body. Oh, Christ says, not that which goes into a man's mouth defileth him, but what comes out of his mouth. Because what comes out of a man's heart comes out of his mouth, and Christ says, that defiles a man. Why? Because out of the bones of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. Oh, and he says, well, and it defileth the whole body. And it set upon fire the course of nature. Our expression is, uh, let nature take its course. That's our, our expression. And to let nature take its course means let things just go like they go without any interference. Just let the thing run out. And it sets on fire the course of nature. And the course of nature, let the things that naturally work out, they set on fire of hell. Obviously, the passage right there, right there, is not literal, because he's applying it to a tongue and what the tongue produces. But it connects it with hell, and it connects with fire burning, and uh, in the book of Proverbs, there's all kinds of verses on that. Now, I can't turn them because I don't have my good mind mind here with me, but if somebody get a reference on the fellow that has burning lips, um, in the the Proverbs, it'll be there, and it'll be there about the Proverbs is filled with stuff about the lips and about the speech. What is it? 26, 22. 26, 22. Or 25, 18. Okay. Uh, the first one was 25, 18. No, but that's about the amount of what? Dylan, 26, what? 22. 22, there we go. Here we go. Yeah. All right, here, 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 here we go. 26, 18. As a mad man who casts firebrands, arrows, and death, so is a man that deceives his neighbor and saith. See that thing? Burning fire in the tongue. Where no wood is, as the fire goes out. There it is. So where there's no tail bearer, there's the tongue. You see it? For slight seasons. As coals are the burning coals, like fire in hell. And wood to fire, like in hell. So is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a tail bearer is wounds that go down the innermost parts of the belly. Burning lips. See it, 23? Burning lips. The tongue is like a fire, except on the course of fire, course of nature, and set on fire of hell. Burning lips and the wicked heart are like a posture and couple of silver draws. He that hates the son of the lips. 25. Speak. See that stuff? 28. Lying tongue. See that stuff? A flattering mouth. See that stuff? The mouth. Well, how, behold how great a matter a little fire kindles, uh, James says. Now, you're Christians, and well, really all of you, and I'll tell you how Christians are. And a lot of things I don't know, like I told you before, but I do know Christians. And I know you. I've had to get thrown with you. I've been thrown with you for 46 years and 400 churches in about uh, 40 states, so I know you. 
And uh, I don't know nothing, I know Christian. And what Christians do is they quit smoking and quit drinking and quit dancing and quit cussing and quit playing bingo and they make up a whore with a big mouth. I saw a pastor's car, they just parked right next to him. The woman that went down the line said she got saved. Well, let me tell you something about uh, The reason why, the reason why most church like this has such a slow growth, has such a time, they came in is really simple. Outside this door, there are how many people in, in 500,000 in Seattle? 800,000? Or out, outside this door, 800,000 people out there, and they're all doing the same thing tonight. You know what they're doing? They're trying to find happiness. They're trying to be happy. That's what they're all doing. You know what they do? They watch you to see how happy you are. They watch you, you Christian people. And once they find that you're just as miserable as they are, they just count your religion just like that. They write you off. Because they figure you don't have any more than they do. So they can hurt the church. Really hurts the local church. It's big mouths. That's what does the damage. And the system is pious too. It's real pious too. But the world, they 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 know when you're cutting somebody's throat. And you take and you complain about the nursery, you complain about the lights, you complain about the air conditioning, you complain about the preacher, you complain about the choir, you complain about the beacon, you complain about this, you complain about that, and write about this, and write about that. They see it. They see it. They, they, they check things. The reason why some of you Christians have to go through some great fiery trial, that's figurative too, some great fiery trial is, is because God intends you to be an example of some unsaved person he's trying to reach. And it shows an unsafe person that you've got something you don't have. And that's a rough way for God to use it. But he'll do it. So make up all the tongue. Now the tongue in the past is, is figurative. And that tongue gets things going. The course of nature. Let nature take its course. The guy says the thing and the chain reaction starts. And then goes and goes and goes. Now here's the way it works out there in the, in the woods. The guy gets out and picks up a match strikes the match and puts it down in some pine needles. See? That nice little fire there. And then let nature take its course. And up to go to this cedar, up to go to this cedar, up to go to this bird. First thing you do, got the smoke over the mountain, man, planes, planes dump and fly around, kind of dump stuff in there, and smoke run up there 8,000 feet in the air. Behold, I agree, a matter of little fire kindles. Well, that's what the passage is. And the passage is figured. But it's uh, it's right, it's correct. The last Sir? Oh, I set on fire of hell. That is the idea, it is it is it is the things that accompany the things that the things that put men in hell where they burn are the things that get the tongue going. And there's a bunch of lying one of them, all liars find the lake of fire, Revelation chapter twenty. The fear of man, Revelation chapter 20, going to hell. Uh, whoever loveth and maketh a lie, Revelation chapter The things that populate hell are the things that get the tongue going. Oh, I something else. I'm a big Bible believer, so I don't know much about this book, but I found a couple of things. I don't know if they match. Uh, Genesis 2.10 says that a river went out of Eden to water the garden. From this, uh, it was parted and became into four heads. Uh, it doesn't seem to mention any water coming into Eden, but just coming out. And then you go to uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 21. Uh, it talks about, let's see, maybe it's the wrong spot. It talks about a Oh, 20, 22 verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the midst uh, and of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there was a throne in, in the garden? Or oh, I think so. The answer that is, you've got uh, two pretty good references there and pretty good proof that the river that comes out of Eden in chapter 2 verse 10 is supernatural. So it's, it's a good comparison of script. Now, whether the throne is there or not, I don't know. But we'll tell you one thing. When Adam and Eve get run out of the Garden of Eden, uh, 
thing that happens, chapter 3, verse 24, he drove out the man and placed the beast to guard the meat and cherubims. You know the cherubims are in Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, they're around the throne. They're around the throne. So it's a pretty good shot. But they went to the Lord was there at that time. Now uh, something else about it. In chapter 3, when God drives that man out, uh, 323 drove him forth from the Garden of Eden. And when that happens, Abel and Cain must have come back to some place because it says in 4, 3, in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. Brought it. So it's coming to some place. Now all you can get out of that is when he drove by that garden of out here in the east, when Cain brings us off, he comes up to the gate for the sheriff bar and offers it right there. Of course, he can't get in. So I would, I would be able to answer you definitely, but I'd say it's, it's pretty, there's real good evidence the water is supernatural. There's real good. And there's some evidence the throne might have been there. Oh, I saw that. Boy, you're going to get a little bit from a, a man in the south by that accent that was too fast for me. Um, in the Old Testament, people died and went to paradise, paradise because their sins were paid for. And uh -huh. could they sin in paradise? And, and the last part is... Could they stay in paradise? Could they stay in paradise? Sin in paradise. Sin in paradise. No, no way in the world, man. Oh, uh, get to uh, Second Corinthians. Oh, uh, I think it's a movie by that time. Somebody made one time, or something like that. And the person you might think about sin in paradise, they usually refer to Adam and Eve in paradise and sin. But the paradise you're talking about is something else. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and Luke chapter, Luke chapter 23. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Luke chapter 23. Now this thing here, the way, the way they can't sin here is real simple. They got no physical body to sin here. The soul is gone. And what's down there in paradise is not a body at all like Adam and Eve had when they sinned. All right, Luke chapter 23, here's Christ dying on the cross. Look at this interchange here with the thief. Uh, verse uh, four, uh, verse uh, 39, 23, 39. One of the malefactors which were hanging real on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answer rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, stay out the same condemnation? 42. And he said, Jesus, Lord, Lord, remember me when thou comest thy kingdom. Now here it is. 43. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say to thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now last night I drew you a picture of that. And I showed you how paradise was straight down under your feet. It was called Abraham's bosom. And when Christ died, he didn't go to glory. His spirit went back to God and went to that last night. And his soul went to the heart of the earth and went to that last night. So paradise in this past, he was down under a man's feet. Now paradise in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 is up on the surface, on top. But after the flood, it isn't there. It downstairs. I turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and look what happened after the resurrection of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. It must have been some condition he was in. Couldn't tell with anybody or out. So like a Samadhi and Nirvana, enlightenment, and tripping on drugs. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether the body out of the body, I cannot tell God know it. Now watch it. He was caught up into paradise. Then it changed. Paradise was down in Luke 23. When you get to 2 Corinthians 12, 3 is up. So paradise now has changed places. Now the way you explain that is what I showed you last night. I showed you Christ going down and going through there and taking those people up with him when he went up. That's the only way you explain it. All I come to Revelation, and look what he says here about uh, paradise in the uh, book of Revelation. Um, Revelation chapter uh, 3, I think it is. Uh, Revelation 2 or 3. What is it? 2 
27. There you go. Him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Rabbit in paradise in Genesis 1 and 2. Which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It's upstairs. That tree of life now is upstairs. It was on the ground. Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 2. No doubt about where it is. Revelation 22, 2. In the midst of the street of it, beside the river, was there the tree of life. So it's up in glory, that thing. Now, the way that works is this. In the Old Testament, that fellow that got saved he couldn't go to the third heaven because his sins weren't paid for. When Christ died on the cross, his sins weren't paid for. So when Christ goes down, I did this last night, he took those Old Testament saints out of Abraham's bosom, called paradise. It has to be paradise because he said if a dying thief today, you go move in paradise. And the thief died that day. So he's down there and he comes up. When he comes up, that place down there is heaven. And paradise now is upstairs. So we know that because Paul was caught up to paradise. What happened is Paul's down there in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 14. He's out there on the ground. He's had beat to death. And they, they left him for dead. They thought he died. They stoned him. And they thought he was dead. And while they stood around, he rose up. He got up and went back to the city. Now he went back to the city where he was stoned, which is very peculiar. You know, kind of a fellow who's kind of a character. <laughs> they just almost killed him. And he gets up and goes right back in the city. Now, you put all that together, and you only get one thing. You get that Paul, bless his heart, great Christian that he was, was a, uh, a suicidal maniac. Right. The guy was trying to get killed all his life. And nobody was trying to be careful could get in the trouble he got in. Did you ever read that thing in, in 2 Corinthians 11? Stone price, whip price, shipwreck price, all that fasting, labor, peril for a fellow. He didn't try to be careful. And here's what happens. He's down on the ground, the body's on the ground. Well, all about the soul, bodily shape, like I do you. And they say he's dead. Cataleptic seizure in a coma. He can't get any heart beat, no pulse, no nothing. And here's this body up there in the third heaven, up in, in New Jerusalem, paradise, looking around. And say, wow, wow, wow. Look at that. And then he's no hand. And he says, Well, I'm pointing, but I don't see any hand. Well, his head through his hand through his head a couple of times, he's got his feet, no feet. And he says in Second Corinthians twelve, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. God knows. Says it twice. Or he looked there looking like that about the time he sees Stephen. Stephen's up there. Hi, Steve. Hi, Paul. Wow, bless God, boy. He let us settle down in Landon Mansion. Lord says, okay, out. And Paul says, out. <laughs> Lord says, yeah, out. Well, I'm saved. Well, we'll bring it here later on. Well, a year, a year up here, okay, a year. How about a year? Lord says, out. Get out, right back down. I got some for you down there. Two weeks, Lord, two weeks. Two weeks out there. It takes two weeks to make eight. No, out, out. The Lord trying to go out for a three out. And that soul comes back in that body, and that body gets up off that ground. I mean, shoulders and busted bullet holes, bloody scabs, camel stand there, up a stick like a camel, and flies around that camel, that stench, and that hot sun. That old boy gets up in the ground there, and here he is back in this earth, and he goes right back into that town. I, I know I knew what he I knew it I knew, I knew it in the scripture, but I know I know what he was doing. He gonna say this time we'll get the job. <laughs> and uh, now you know how I know that? Because I know how I am. And I trust you are. I mean honest to God, people, what if the Lord took you up there tonight and showed it to you? See you don't know what's there. You believe it's there because you was talking about it. Like our brother last night, you know. And I believe it by faith, but I've never seen it. I don't know it's there. But faith is something they hope for, the evidence of things not seen. So I, I live my life. I bet my soul, you don't you see what we're doing with the biggest bunch of fools in the world. We're betting our soul that book is right. Amen. That's what we're doing. I don't make any, any bones about it. I've got my soul betting that book. 
And if that book didn't lie on the biggest fool you ever saw in your life. Well, it's got compensation because if the book isn't still right, I got the best of it anyway. I mean, if that book turned out it wasn't true, well, the, the life I've had with Christ since then, I wouldn't trade that for nothing anyway. So who cares? But anyway, if, if, if we're taking for granted so now, but I don't know that. I have my way out by my sin, just like you do out by yours. And whenever God gets on me for not being zealous enough, you know, and close enough, and like Paul, Paul said, be a follower of me, I'm a pattern of them should hereafter believe, and I fail to meet the standard, I would have got my alibi. And I say, well, you took him up. <laughs> you know, you made him see it, you never let me see it. I'll be a different kind of Christian, but I can see it, you know, that kind of stuff. But now, if the Lord took me up tonight and showed me that place, and I saw the mansion and saw the streets, just like he said, and realized no more crying, no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, boy, he would take angelic violence to get me out. <laughs> I wouldn't want to come down. He would come back down this mess after getting in that. But you've got out, you wouldn't be safe. You wouldn't be safe. You'd be trying to preach on the street in the middle of the interstate. <laughs> <laughs> somebody hits you. So to answer the question there, there's no sin in paradise because paradise is a beyond the grave condition. All right, something else. Sorry, I was just wondering, uh, when the Lord went up to offer up the kingdom to, the, to Israel, and if the um, leaders of Israel had accepted, then Jesus Christ, I believe, still had to be crucified. Who would have crucified him and why would he have done it? And like, sort of a all right. Get Acts chapter 7. Now, this is a dispensational thing. And this thing holds the key to actually understanding about a third of the New Testament. You get this key here, you can get a hold of, uh, you get a hold of uh, Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, and Revelation. But uh, they don't teach it in any school. Well, Bob Drew probably teaches it in his school and some of the other fellows. But I mean, you get a big school like Bob Jones at Tennessee Temple or BBC, they're not going to say nothing like this. Oh, uh, and I get to get to, uh, for these things you want Malachi chapter four and Luke chapter one and Acts chapter seven. Malachi four, Luke chapter one, Acts chapter seven. Now I'm going to read you three passages here, and I'm going to draw a little chart so I get this thing worked out. So you can see, you have to see this. But right, Malachi chapter four, the Old Testament ends with prophecies of the second coming of Christ. If you look at Malachi chapter 4, the last three verses, you'll find there are two people connected with the second coming. Moses and Elijah. Just like he brought up in the Mount of Transfiguration. And then he says about Elijah, verse 5. I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So they're all looking for Elijah to show up. You know what they asked John the Baptist? Art thou Elijah? He says, I am not. And Christ says, uh, he spoke about uh, John the Baptist. How could Christ say John the Baptist alive yeah, and John the Baptist said, I ain't? There's a good contradiction for you. <laughs> they say, oh, what that thing there says, Elijah's coming. So when Christ died on the cross and says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, somebody said he's calling for Elijah. And they said, let's see if Elijah will come and get him down. See, they all Elijah was coming. That uh, the fellow that uh, got that thing was Malcolm X and Muhammad Elijah, Elijah Muhammad, that bunch, they all think they're a forerunner of the second coming of Christ. And they're just as nutty as a pecan pie. Elijah is going to come. But Christ says, when I say to Elijah, come already, and they knew him not. Then understood the disciples how he's taken John the Baptist. So something's all contradicted. Now, whenever you find the Bible contradicts, that does about. 200 places. Whatever the Bible contradicts, you've always lost a key to something. Because God can't really contradict himself. But when you find two verses that go right against each other, you've got to look for a reason. Here's a good one. Answer the fool according to his folly, lest to be wise in his own conceit. Next verse. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto it. You never saw him work for perfect contradiction on your life. But that one's talking how to about how to deal with a certain kind of a fool, and this one how to deal with another kind of fool. And here's the one. Whatever in the moves in the seed that doesn't have pennies in the scale should be an abomination on you. The man that doeth such things should have cut off from his people. You like lobster? 
No fins and scales. Do I climb? No fins, do I shrimp? No fins and scales. Do I catfish? No scales. You gonna go to hell? <laughs> Here they come not eat anything that's uh, clothed and put it doesn't chew the cud, like uh, the, the pig, pork, do you like pork chops? Do you like barbecue pork? Go to hell sure the boat. <laughs> Leviticus eleven. I don't see anybody do it. Not eat pork. Man, pork's a staff of life. Block <laughs> burst and vice burst and, and heel blows you know and pull the coffee. Man, what would life be without that man? Now, whenever you find now I'll give you a verse contradicts. Every creature of God is good and nothing be refused to be received a thanksgiving for the sanctifying of the word of God in prayer. First Timothy four. I first come to four says, you can ask God to bless it for you, put it in your mouth, put it in your mouth. The Vicar says if it's pig or clam or lobster or catfish or shrimp you can't eat. Now they contradict. Now you know the obvious answer to that one, the answer is one of the Old Testament, one of the New Testament. But some of them aren't that easy. Now look at this one here, Luke chapter one. And here comes John the Baptist. This is before he's born. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 16, when it's quoting John the Baptist, it changes the last two verses of Malachi and says this, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. That's the end of Malachi. And he shall go before him, underline it, in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah. He's not Elijah. To turn the hearts of the father of the children, that this be the wisdom of the just, to make ready people prepared for the Lord. So he's not Elijah. But he is. On well, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. Now, this is the question he asked. He was asked about if they received Christ. And Acts chapter 7, I have a chance to receive them and don't do it. They turn him down. This is after the resurrection. Acts 7, verse. Uh, 55, and he being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfast in the heavens, saw the glory of God, and he was standing on the right hand of God, which is peculiar. Every other passage that says he's sitting, sit thou at my right hand, I make thy end of my footstool. Christ is standing, he's sitting, but he's standing there. And he said, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now this is this dispensational setup, and this thing is, it will work. It's infallible in that it's the only system that will preserve the integrity of Scripture. It is infallible because it's mine. It's the only one that preserves the integrity of the Scripture. And if you get another one, it'll cross up the Scripture. Are you hear what's going on? Christ's going to come here to die on the cross. That has to be. In plain words, that much of the Scripture has to be fulfilled. He has to die. Or he has to come up from the dead. That's the Scripture. He has to sit at God's right hand and examine his footstool. Psalm 100, and that, that's true. Whatever the Old Testament said that had to be fulfilled has to be fulfilled. So they have to reject him, and he has to die, and he has to be buried after the dead. That is, no, he's, when he comes here in the throne, he's got to come as a judge. Daniel chapter 2, the kingdoms have to come here. Daniel chapter 7. But here's the trouble. When this Old Testament prophet looks down through history like this, he sees all this stuff right together. The birth of Christ, the death of Christ, the suffering and the glory that should follow, the resurrection of Christ, the Antichrist, the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the white throne judgment, the new heaven and the new earth. He sees them all right there. And they're all together. He says, Simon Peter says, those Old Testament prophets, when they prophesied, they shook what manner of uh, time the Spirit of Christ which was then signified when it testified of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should be thereafter. And they see him in one unit, and they couldn't figure him out. To this day, the Jew can't figure that. The Jews waiting for the fellow to come on a white horse and save them from the Arabs and the Gentiles. Second coming. But he got them right together. And that's what how those old prophets confounded. Now, when you read your Old Testament, you find things like this. Sometimes you get time to check it. Genesis 49. From thence is the shepherd. One verse. First advent. The stone of Israel. Second advent. And one verse. From thence the shepherd, comma, the stone. The stone of the smiting stone of Daniel 2. Here's a good one here. Genesis 49. Binding his ass to the vine and the choice vine, 
triumphal entry in Jerusalem. He washed his garments in the blood of the grave, second half, and he stomped them out. And it's one verse of a classic illustration. This is in Luke 4. In Luke chapter 4, Christ goes in the synagogue and opens the book. And he opens Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he wanted me to preach the gospel to the poor, to sell the captives, the brokenhearted, and the priest the acceptable day of the Lord. Semicolon. And the year of vengeance. Second act. I don't think it's even a semicolon. Somebody check out Isaiah 61, about verse uh, 1 and 2. It might be a comma. It's a comma. 2,000 years, man, on a comma. That's why that Bible says, Study to show by yourself a proof unto God, a word that he's not to be ashamed, rightly divided. Amen. The word of proof. You have got to get the divisions right, or it don't make any sense. Christ said, the, the acceptable year, comma, and the day of vengeance, they were right together. Now, sometime you read your Bible, didn't you ever wonder about, wonder about this? The kingdom of heaven's at hand, the kingdom of heaven's at hand, the kingdom of heaven's at hand, the kingdom of God's at hand. You got two thousand years of heaven on earth after it was at hand. Did you ever wonder about that? It's right here, it's at hand. I come quickly. <laughs> sure dragging your feet, man. In 1900 years, World War I, World War II, Filipino insurrection, the Civil War, American Revolutionary War, French Revolution, Crusades, Inquisition, something kingdom, huh, buddy? I mean, that's, and these post millennials they keep talking about the kingdom coming. The, they know kingdom coming. The kingdom of coming, the kingdom of death and hell, that's what's coming. But not here. The kingdom of God's at hand. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's that stuff. It's right here. It's right here. I give you real good. The night Jesus was born. Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace. <laughs> peace, goodwill to men. What kind of a book is that? <laughs> I mean, the baby is born, and the angel is singing, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill. My God, you call that peace? <laughs> I mean, this, this, you, you, you realize since 1914, 59 million unarmed civilians have been killed in genocides. They weren't even in combat. 59 million civilians, gun control, right. Cambodia, Thailand, down there in Central Africa, Turkey, 59 million <coughs> men, women, and unarmed men, women, children killed after gun control all the past. Right. These gun Americans, no, I just thought I came in the McDonald's and shot certain people and I followed the looking uh, AK, just a vicious looking weapon, you crazy fool. The first thing to do before they murder you, take your gun. Yeah. And I've got nothing to do with Baptist or preachers. Right, yeah. I'm going, I don't care if you're unsaved. You might like those Jews for America to set up a little, you see when you sign a paper like this and it says all those in favor of gun control raise your right hand? How many of you have seen them that thing? You know, put those things out the Jews. The Jews publish that thing. Not even Christians. They've got more sense than you got. <laughs> Amen, brother. I mean, 59 million casualties, man. You call that peace on earth? Why are they doing that? Because it's coming, it's right there. Yeah. And some go wrong. And what goes wrong goes wrong in Acts 7. The thing is right there, he comes up and forgiven Acts chapter 2, the king is coming, Acts chapter 3, the Messiah is coming, Acts chapter 7, we won't have it. And all this stuff goes clean over here beyond 1995. And that old prophet looking down here saw them all together, and there's a church age between them. That thing's a mystery. You know what that thing is? It's in Ephesians 3, and Paul said it's a mystery of evil to him, nobody knew about the Old Testament. It's a gap in there. Now it's coming up here. Now look at here. Christ dies, he's buried, he comes up. And if that Jew had accepted him, John the Baptist would have been alive. And if they don't accept him, John the Baptist is not Elijah, and Elijah comes back over here. Yeah. Folks, do you realize, most people don't realize, I know you think you know it in your head, but you don't, not really. Do you realize how smart God is? <laughs> <laughs> you know, God has such intelligence and foreknowledge and forethought, he can work that thing out so no matter what you do, it still comes out his way. Amen. If they accepted Christ, it'd go on one way. If they rejected him, it'd go on the other. But he had both both ways figured. That's a blue cow out of the side of the land. 
old Calvin said he knew what was going to take place because he ordained it to take place. No, but you got it wrong. He knows what would take place if what took place hadn't taken place. Right. Amen. 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 Calvin, he was deficient in brain. <laughs> Let me ask you this. You want to play chess with the Lord? <laughs> Who do you think would win? <laughs> okay. Let me ask you this. How many moves would he have to make for you in order to win? Now think. Think. Right. Now wake up. Think. How many moves would he have to make for you in order to beat you? None, of course. Free will. Help yourself. Make any cut and take a move you want to make. It don't make any difference. <laughs> you're going to win anyway. <laughs> you might as well just do what you're told and quit fighting. Amen. Amen. But if you're going to run out. Now, something like that, that's the key to that thing. And if that you had accepted Christ, all this stuff would have come to pass behind it and all been fulfilled. They didn't. So it slips off over here. Getting late, I'll give you one more illustration of what I'm trying to on my ashes and question about this. Let me ask you this. Uh, Christ died with Mary Rose in the day, but he comes up at Sunday morning. He's out in the Sea of Galilee, and Pete's going fishing. He fished all night, caught nothing. Some of you thought have been a fishing trip like that. <laughs> I've been on some of that. And they say, you know, owls in the east wind and the moon or something like that. Everybody fished all night and caught nothing. And they come in the morning, Jesus up there on the shore and said, it's me, boys. And Peter jumps over the boat and slips the two twenty about a minute flat. This is a living Bible version I'm giving you. <laughs> and he gets to the shore, he comes up to the shore. They sit down at the shore, and here's a bunch of coals out there. And on this, these coals are the prettiest uh, roasted clams and, and barbecued catfish you ever saw in your life. Now, what if I had You know what those disciples have done? They would have thought he was the Antichrist and left. Christ said, I've got many things to show you, but I can't. You're not ready for them now. You know what Peter found was all I can catfish? Acts 10. Acts 10. When the sheep came down, the other animal was on, you see? Or if he'd been handy, he'd been serving barbecue pork there that morning. They'd have got and left. Now I want to ask you a question. If Christ had served barbecue pork and roast clams that morning, in John 21, could they have eaten it? Yeah, sure. How many say yes? You see your hands. How many say no? You see your hands. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Why should they could eat? Paul says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances against us, which was contrary to us, took him out of the way and nailed him to his cross. But who knew that? Nobody. You see? So that revelation is progressive. They're not waiting for the church age. They don't even know what's coming. They're waiting for the Lord to come back in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So at the end of 7, he stands up. Says, you want me to come? Okay, here we go. And Stephen looks up. When he looks up, they say, what do you say, Stephen? He said, there's the son of man standing at the right hand of that Pharisee. That's what that dirty blasphemer said down in the hallway. He said, here after you shall see the son of man coming at the right hand of the power. And they stoned him. And he said, the Lord, he just received my spirit. And the Lord says, that's how you feel about it. And sits back down. And he's been sitting down for 1,900 years. And one of these days, he's going to get up. Amen. And he's going to, he's been resting, you see. No! <laughs> 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 Buddy, you better be on the right side. Yeah. 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 You're gonna mop up the bar room. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of a cool exposition. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. I would take about a ten minute break. Kelly, you come and help me move some of this stuff? Well, there's one line in that song I like. He knew you and he still loves you. Yeah. Yeah. Something to think about. Amen? Yeah. All right. All right. I've got a 